So Lisa Jacobs, Pono Divorce. Wow. This is a whole new thing. You know, divorce can be so ugly and damaging and destructive and ruin lives, you know. Uh, family relationships are so fragile. You have to see this play that I saw over the weekend called Next to Normal at the Manoa Theater. This is a wonderful study in the fragility of the family. Mm -hmm. Every family is fragile. It's almost like you've got to give them a medal for staying together. You uh -huh. know? But sometimes it doesn't work. And that's, you think about that. And as a lawyer, you want to do special stuff on, yes. on families that haven't been able to hold it together. Yes. So how did you get involved in that? Um, I got involved in collaborative divorce. Um, I found out that um, the Uniform Collaborative Law Act um, was passed and signed by Governor Abercrombie on July 3rd of 2012. What that enabled or encouraged is for people in Hawaii to resolve their disputes outside of court. Um, Collaborative divorce has been used in other jurisdictions, and they've tended to focus um, on resolving disputes in that way. Although the Collaborative Uniform Collaborative Law Act keeps open the possibility of other types of relationships that are strained um, to be able to come to resolution outside of court. Here in Hawaii, we're focusing in on divorce at this time. And I'm really excited to um, use the training and the skills that I have in family law and really helping uh, Hawaii's families uh, use the collaborative divorce model in resolving their divorces in a much more respectful way and ways that are less, much less traumatic for the children. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a very nice person. I mean, I, without knowing any more than what you've just said, I would have to characterize you as a nice, and a nice lawyer. I mean, not all lawyers are nice, you can quote me on that. And, and not all divorce lawyers are nice because divorce, you know, in terms of the lawyers involved in divorce, sometimes they're really hard, hard nosed, you know, and, and frankly, instead of helping the situation, they make it worse. Mm -hmm. they, they, as soon as the client walks in, they're whipping up a, an angry, you know, hostile kind of environment. And it's not a good thing. Yes. But you're not into that. You're, in fact, you're rebelling against that, aren't you? Yes, um, traditional litigation driven adversarial models of divorce, what that does is that pits unfortunately the spouses um, as adversary or as foils. In collaborative divorce, we're really looking at the family and restructuring the family in a way that's less uh, harmful and actually healthier as compared to an adversarial model. Um, what was I going to say? <laughs> You were going to say, you forgot what you were going to say. Yes. <laughs> we got her now. Now we got her. <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, one thing I wanted to add is that in law school and, and in an adversarial model, uh, attorneys will have positions that they'll take, and that's in order to maximize resources for their client. In collaborative divorce, it's very different. It's uh, it's values-based or interest-based rather than position-based. So we're really looking at the entire family and how can we restructure the family that's going to work out the best and, and really solve the problems and not create more problems by going to court, uh, litigating the case, driving up attorney's fees. Yeah. You know, this goes this completely so, counter. This so enlightening, really enlightened, you know. I, I grew up in New York, and uh, I was close to what they would define what they called at the time the uh, social work community. Yes. And uh, I, I thought that the people in social work were really wonderful people. I never met a social worker I didn't like, mainly because they were always trying to help people. That you know, and I, I think the profession has changed, and now I could meet people in social work maybe I didn't like so much, but in those days, that's what I thought. And, and I, I sort of have been waiting all these years for social work to come back. Mm -hmm. and I think that's what you're doing. You're bringing the real, the pure social work back where not only you, but the people around you, the people on your team, everybody dedicated to helping people. This is a very noble thing. You're going to go to heaven. You know that. <laughs> well, thank you. I guess um, my mother, who actually passed away about 13, 14 years ago, she was a social worker. So maybe, ah, maybe, I got in, maybe I've got it in my blood. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think <laughs> that I'm so. leaving a good le legacy for my family. Um, yeah, what's really different and unique and special about this um, method of, of divorce is, is that we bring in specialists. We bring in mental health specialists to work with the couple as divorce coaches, 
Um, they can also be child specialists if they have children, really advocating for the needs and concerns of the kids. We also bring in financial um, professionals also to really look at the couple's finances, um, help them come up with solutions that will really work the best both in the long term and the short term. That's great because, you know, I mean, it's, I don't think it's 100%, but in most marriages that fail, they fail because some something went wrong. There was a reason. There was a reason because, you know, you start out with the marriage and you think it's going to work, but then something intervenes, doesn't work. And, and if you can, you know, not that you can save the marriage necessarily, but that if you can identify those problems, maybe you can fix those people so that when they walk out, you know, after the divorce, they're better prepared. Yes. Uh, and it sounds like with the team, that, that actually, that kind of counseling helps them on a long-term basis. Yes, yes. Um, really, the team approach is to encourage the couple to work on their communication skills. Um, we're really trying to share the information so they can make, make the best choices. Um, it's not always easy. I mean, there can be times where there will be, will, will be impasse, but we're going to, you know, help come up with um, options and creative solutions so they can see beyond just getting stuck and saying, okay, we've got this option here, we've got that option there. Um, we don't always have monetary interests involved. Oftentimes, there's, uh, most importantly, there's non-monetary interests yeah. which need to be addressed. Yeah. Um, the couple will have their fears, their concerns. Um, the team is there to address those, and the specialists are there to, um, the financial professionals there to um, address their, their monetary um, fears and concerns, and the relationship um, experts and the mental health experts are there to really address their, their emotional concerns. But, so they'll you know, come out of the process much healthier. Just so I can appreciate it, it's not like you sit there at a big table and the team walks in on you and they all, some of them wearing white coats or whatever, you know, <laughs> and, and they all sit and, and look at you like a bunch of doctors, you know, and <laughs> try, to, try to figure out what's wrong. It's, it's that the individuals meet with them one by one, right? Well, actually, um, when we have the attorney, the collaborative attorneys meet with the, the spouses, that is typically a four-way meeting. So, uh, and you can contrast that with an adversarial model where typically the client will meet with his or her attorney just one-on-one. -on -one, and there's discouraging open communication. The spouses should not be communicating directly because that could be going against their positional interests. But um, in collaborative law, we'll meet as groups, and we will really work together. So you have more than one specialist there at a time? Uh, typically, yes. We'll have the... Um, rarely will it just be a one-on-one. -on -one. When the divorce coach initially meets with his or her client, um, you know, they probably will meet one-on-one. -on -one. But after that, people will meet as groups because that's the way to come up with the, bless, the best solutions is to put a whole bunch of heads together. Well, that's great then. So they, you can actually get the benefit of not only, you know, the multiple specialists, but the specialists in the same room talking to each other. Yes. And so it's a really a group effort, mm -hmm. I like that. Um, you know, one thing is that this isn't really like the conventional practice of law at all because you have this agreement, right? And the agreement says we're going to do it differently. Yes. What does the agreement say? I mean, the agreement, I guess, is consistent with the statute. Yes. It all springs out of this statute. Yes, you know? yes. But what does the agreement say? Right. Um, part and parcel of collaborative law is this agreement, which is called the participation agreement. And the participation agreement is what the the couple signs along with their collaborative attorneys. And basically what it says there is that we are all pledging that we are going to be acting in good faith and cooperating and um, setting forth information in a timely fashion in order to resolve the case outside of court. So that agreement is signed in the outset and that sets the spirit and the course uh, for um, the process to continue. So. Because they're agreeing from the outset that they're going to really work their hardest to resolve it out of court, thankfully, and, it, and the great news is, is that these have been highly successful. Um, the agreement rate exceeds 90% because people are coming in from the beginning you know, saying that you, we're going who, to... Who really signed the agreement? 90% of the people who come in sign the agreement? Or? No, no, no. They sign the agreement. Uh, they, they will all sign the agreement because they're on board. They follow the agreement. And yes, the, 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 the success rate in actually arriving at resolving all the issues outside of court exceeds 90%. Wow. Let's talk about the 10% though. Well, and the 10% actually does not, um, does, uh, includes actually reconciliation too, because of the improved communication, 
there, you know, is that small, small percentages of couples that will decide to stay together, which is totally wonderful. I mean, if that is ultimately, if we're trying to uh, keep families uh, healthy and uh, in the best shape, you know, if they can stay together and it, it improve their communication, that's wonderful as well. Yeah, no, that's great. And actually, the, the, the process you describe, it sounds like that's always a possibility. In fact, this is kind of n nourishment that you give them with the, you know, with the specialists and all that um, could easily lead to that, easily. So, well, you know, I haven't been following this this rule or that rule. And uh, I've been, I haven't been Akamai about money. And he explained to me about what I should be doing with money. And, you know, if I change that, maybe we could... Maybe we could get back together again. What do you think? And so, so you know, it's an open channel. It's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Of course. Yes, yes. Um, in fact, for us to get this information out to marriage and family therapists, they think it's wonderful. Because, of course, they're trying to work with couples to see if they can improve communication, to see if their marriages can remain together. But if they find out that it's, you know, really not going to work, then collaborative divorce is the next best thing. Yeah. It's, it's really the healthier yes. option than to send them out to the sharks, you know, who are going to go and yeah. really rip the family apart. Yes, well, I've, we've seen that, actually. I mean, I, I did some divorce practice way back, and um, I saw that many times. Yes. And even if you were the nice guy, and I was always the nice guy, you found that your adversary was, you know, trying to skin everybody alive. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's the lowest common denominator in that kind of case, you know. <laughs> any any one any one of the lawyers could just drop the whole thing down to the basement, you know. <laughs> but um just uh, uh about the about the possibility of it failing, okay? So so we have uh, 90% succeed. We have a some part of that 5% Okay. Ten percent doesn't succeed. Okay. Uh, but because they reconcile, now we have the part that doesn't succeed because they get mad at each other. How does that work? Okay. Well, right. I mean, it's not always a guarantee, but what the participation agreement says in it is that if the couple reaches an impasse and they decide to take it to court, then the collaborative attorneys are terminated from the case, as well as all of the attorneys in their firm as well. So it really I mean, collaborative attorneys go into it saying that, you know, it's in our best interest to have you all have the family work together and work out the best solution. Because if it doesn't, then I'm out of a job. You're out of a job and they're out of a lawyer. In right. other words, they can't they can't come around and, uh, may I say, manipulate you back into a adversarial role. Right. You, I, you, you have told them clearly, if you want to be an adversary, you've got to go somewhere else. Right. I can't just <laughs> change hats and say, now I'm going to, you know, yeah, that's slug right. it out. That's right. a legal problem, right. ethical problem, Right, too. right, right. You know, I'm going to work cooperatively with you and your spouse, but, you know, if we... Um, if, if the two of you go to litigation, then I'm going to right, change hats and I'm going to start, you know, doesn't feel uh, right. be the gladiator. No, 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 <laughs> it no, doesn't no. that'd be hard on you, but it would also be an ethical problem, I think. Yes. Because you have already extended yourself to both sides of the transaction. Yes. <clears throat> and it was not fair. I mean, it, it sort of doesn't pass the smell test. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, actually, that's very good because I think that it acts as a sanction. You know, if they if they get mad at each other and they want to go hack each other up, um, fine, on somebody else's truck, not here. Goodbye. Right, right. And, and having the collaborative team there is we really work on um, getting them past that anger or the impasse. Yeah. And, again, that's why we have such a high success yeah. or agreement rate because we can kind of get them back and thinking, having them focus more on solutions rather than perpetuating problems. But, but it always remains a possibility, doesn't it? I mean, if they get hoo-hoo about something. Um, you know, get some some kind of excitement, some kind of, they get something up their nose, so to speak. <laughs> then they can have an argument right there. This would be a bad day, huh? They have an argument right there and say, oh, I'm going to take you to court. <laughs> Goodbye, Lisa, we're leaving. You know? Well, maybe that's the time to call a timeout <laughs> yeah, really. and maybe get a little bit, you know, get a little yeah. bit of food in front of them uh, yeah, to get food. them to, go, right, get them to um, ha bring things down a little bit and then come back later. Come back when um, their minds are a little more clear. This and, is a uh, combination of therapy. Therapy is right. <laughs> social work. It's, it's, yes, it's yes. from the whole social work establishment. Mm -hmm. And really, I mean, I, one thing it keeps I keep thinking about this talking to you is that how come we didn't have this earlier? I mean, we've had, you know, I mean, some awful divorce practice I mean, in terms of the way it works and, sorry, but the judges and, and the, the outcomes have been really awful. I mean, damaging people for the rest of their lives. Why didn't we do this earlier? Some law firms in town, I think, 
have specialized in, you know, a very conciliatory kinds of approach. Mm-hmm. And they, they try to avoid, you know, whipping up an angry proceeding. Um, but, but we haven't seen this before. Why, ha- why has it taken so long? Yeah, I mean, systems, sometimes it, it, it takes a while to change systems, and uh, systems aren't always the most, he- most healthy, but people tend to do what they're used to doing. So uh, people develop habits. Uh, the habits aren't necessarily the best habits, but because there isn't uh, uh, another way that's been introduced that's been proven, um, they might just continue to do the same thing over and over again, even again, if it's not the best thing to, to do. So. Um, having the Uniform Collaborative Law Act that was passed in Hawaii is really a breath of fresh air because it, the legislature, the governor, uh, the courts, everybody's saying that the, the time has come, that we're going to resolve um, conflicts, especially conflicts between individuals that had a close relationship. And we really want to try to preserve those relationships the best we can rather than tear them apart. Yeah. Well, and for the benefit of the community, too, I mean, this is important social legislation as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you, know, you mentioned earlier when we spoke that 50% of divorces fail. This is really a frightening figure. Because, I mean, not, not in the one case, but in the macro case. All these divorces, I mean, happening in the community, leaving all these unhappy people around mm-hmm. who have to pick up and restart their lives. Um, that, I, that figure, by the way, is that higher or lower than it was, say, 10 20 years ago? Um, I think that... Or is it the same? I think it might be going up um, a a little bit. Um, It's that maybe perhaps, you know, 50 years ago, people didn't talk so much about it. Um, They stayed in traces. Yeah. Socially required for them to tough it out. Right. Maybe they were staying together for the sake of the kids. Um, now divorce tends to be more normalized in the sense that it happens more, but I still think that there's a lot of shame associated with it. Um, a sense of failure, um, that they did something wrong. Um, and that unfortunately can carry into further, re- you know, um, further relationships or future relationships with people. Um, one thing that collaborative divorce brings to it is that, you know, divorce is, is normal and you shouldn't be shamed by it. Um, things happen. Um, we can't always prevent things from happening, but what we can do is we can think more forward focused and say, okay, from here on out, how can I change my behavior? How can I act in ways that are more healthy? Be a better person, maybe have a better marriage the next time. Yes. You know, yes. I mean, really that would be important. And I'm, and I'm wondering, I mean, what, what is the model of the individual you want to send out, um, I, I guess it might be different between a man and a woman, but I mean, for example, a woman finished with a divorce, she goes out there, she's not angry. Mm-hmm. She actually has, I'm making this up, she actually has a reasonably, you know, congenial relationship with her former husband. Okay. She has close relationships with the children. Neither the husband or the wife are using the children as, as uh, you know, as, as levers mm-hmm. on the other party. Um, and if she gets into trouble, she can call him, he'll help her and all that. In other words, it's it's none of that old baggage Mm -hmm. and she doesn't feel like she's damaged goods. And when she gets married again, she can talk about it. It's not, you know, am I right? I mean, are you trying to model a, uh, an outcome so that this person is, uh, completely undamaged? You know, I think you said a minute ago that, that, um, you, you want to set it up so that they, they're prepared, uh, and I, I'm wondering what the, what the model is. What is this person walking out, man or woman, walking out into the street? How is this person built now after going through your process? I think that they're better equipped to handle uh, life's challenges. Um, they'll be better equipped to handle their money. Uh, they'll be better equipped to deal with, uh, you know, emotional challenges that are faced just living life. Um, they, even in... Um, communicating with their ex-spouses. Um, they'll be able to have a good working relationship here on out with them, um, regardless if they have children or not, um, that they can remain friendly and, and civilized to one another. It's the modern way, for sure. Yes. It's ideal. So, I mean, I know it's it's not absolute, but how many, what percentage would you expect to, you know, achieve that level of, that level of health? Mm-hmm. Of all of them? Half of them? What? Um, I would hope that with uh, having the uh, the collaborative team there to help 
work through these issues and keep the lines of communication really open that um, that just about every person who comes through a collaborative divorce well, will great. come out a better person. That's great. Can they go back to the counselors later? For example, if I liked uh, a member of the team, could I call that person up and buy his time and get some further advice? This is after the process is over. Okay. Uh, I believe so, yes. I don't think that there's anything preventing them. So they're not in your office per se. They're contractors, and you bring them in for a case. Is that what it is? Right, right. Um, the the specialist will, you know, bill out, I think, normally at an hourly rate. So I don't think that there's anything that's preventing the um, the people utilizing their services to, after the divorce, to continue to that's use their great. services. That's great. So they, they've made a friend. You know, I mean, I think you talk about stigmas. I think a lot of people have stigmas about dealing with professionals who advise them, mm -hmm. paying for them, spending the time with them, telling anybody that they're using them. <laughs> but if you hand them a relationship like that in the course of a larger process, then you're, you're breaking that barrier down. There's no more stigma. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, they don't have to, right? You don't have to worry about it. It's not a loss of face, all that stuff. Sure. So you're actually giving them a gift that they can take further down the road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, so uh, what about the property settlement aspect to this? Do do the parties come in and they, uh, you know, each one takes a position of what they want, and how do you resolve that? Well, what the collaborative lawyers will do is they will sit down with their with their clients and really find out what their hopes are, what their concerns are, and what their fears are. And once we know all that, um, and we're working again as a team, we're going to find ways to resolve these, uh, address these fears and, and concerns. But again, keep it all within the context of this, we're restructuring a family. So, you know, you're not necessarily going to try to take the most you can because what is that going to do to the other person? You always consider the needs of the other person as well and of the children as well. So, you know, there is settlement built into it because it's not you know, winner take all. It's how do we work this so everybody can be, you know, everybody wins in this situation. Do they, do they buy in or do you have trouble selling that? Well, um, you know, that's what we communicate from the outset is that um, it's going to take a certain person who's going to be drawn to this. People who are angry, vengeful, um, we hope that they can see beyond that, um, but they won't always. So collaborative divorce won't be for everybody, but we hope that, you know, most people will, can see beyond anger, revenge, you know, trying to get back at their ex. Who will it not be appropriate for? <laughs> <laughs> well, we would hope that we, we, it would be appropriate for almost anybody. Okay, and but, but what about the people that wouldn't be appropriate for? They're the angry, vengeful ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is going to be a certain maybe narcissistic personality who will spend, they don't care, at all monetary costs, they're going to, you know, try to stick it to their ex. So they are perfectly happy to spend, you know, over $100,000 to stick it to their ex. Can we ever change their mind and get them on board to collaborative divorce? Probably not. Um, we'd like to still have them consider it as an option, but if they're so angry or so, uh, you know, uh, vengeful that they want to, to, to do that, I mean, we're, we, we're not in a position to change people. I could see a hard-driving, control-freak type executive who said, you know, me, submit to this kind of process? I must control everything, and I'm not going to do it. I mean, I can see that as a, some, somebody in that small percentage of people who it, it wouldn't work for. I mean, people who, for example, would rather spend their whole estate fighting than have an estate. <laughs> <laughs> there are people like that. I've mean, even heard of a trust and estate attorneys talk about stories about how people will run the estate into the ground just because they're just angry. Spite, spite. Right, just in spite. So we're not um, going to get anything, nothing. Right, right. Um, I heard a story about two weeks ago, though, of a very um, wealthy individual who went through a collaborative divorce in Texas, and he thought the process was wonderful. And he was so happy that he actually donated $100,000 to the collaborative divorce uh, outfit in, in Texas because yeah. um, they worked it out well. Yeah. Um, and he thought that it was wonderful. It really were, you know, and he, he wasn't out to, you know, well, <laughs> spend good. a lot of money on lawyers just to, you know, make it so his. Well, it his touched him. It, it, yeah. really touched him. it improved his life. He was appreciative. I mean, you know, to me, you have to st you have the baseline is you wake up every day, and the, the good thing about it is you're alive. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is your relationships aren't falling apart. Mm -hmm. And if somebody helps you, 
to achieve those very modest things, <laughs> then you should give them a hundred thousand if you have it. If you have it, <laughs> right? And apparently, his, his ex-spouse was felt happy about it too. You know, it all worked out. So yeah, that's um, great. Great story. You have more stories you wanted to tell. I do. I have um, one story, and it could be almost anybody's story. If uh, somebody has fought with their ex, um, you know, about parenting, and they have different parenting styles, and they have young children. Um, in one case, there was uh, a couple, and they were college sweethearts, you know, so they got married at a relatively young age, and uh, they had a child, a six-year-old boy, and but they fought. They fought about um, how to parent. Uh, they struggled with that, and um, unfortunately, the, the child was uh, felt it was, was his fault. Um, He's the victim then. Right. He was performing um, poorly in school, and he had shared that he really felt like they're fighting, all they're fighting is because of him. So that was the wake-up call for them to say, let's look beyond, you know, me could, trying to control you and you controlling me on how to parent, and really let's focus in on the needs of our son and let's do our divorce collaboratively. And it really worked out best for the family. Yeah, that's a good story. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of stories and a lot of stories coming down the pike, you know, because I think people's expectations are based on the old model. They've talked to their friends. They've heard about all these bish bash cases, <laughs> and they're only too happy not to have that experience. You know? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, another story I have to share is a story where um, family uh, is going through a divorce. Uh, the husband is a business owner, and uh, the business was doing quite well. Um, his wife had ownership interest in the business, but uh, in going through the divorce process, you know, he didn't really want his wife to retain interest in in the business. Um, and so they reached an impasse and the creative solution they came up with was, well, why doesn't she transfer the business interest to the children? Because they can both agree that they want the best for their kids. And he was fine with that. That was the way that they were able to move forward and get past the impasse. If they had gone the traditional adversarial model, they probably wouldn't have come up with that. I don't think a judge would have ordered something like that. Yeah. So having the collaborative team really helped them um, craft creative solutions really worked out the best for them. Yeah. Uh, a, 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 relevant, a, a, a relevant point on that is that people do not understand how tough it is to be a family court judge. Yes. It's a really hard job. I hope you never do this. <laughs> even you know, even when you feel that it might be it might be helpful to the community, um, it's very hard. And and I think what happens is they develop a very thick skin after a relatively short period of time, seeing all the human trouble that comes before them. And I think it skews their judgment sometimes. And so if you go to family court and you expect the judge to really understand the nature of your problem, don't expect that. Right. There's just not enough resources. There's too many cases. Um, yeah, they just they can't deal with it, and that's why they're really doing a pushback, and they they want um, couples to mediate or to resolve their cases before they go to trial. Um, it just makes the most sense for uh, the couple to really come up with their own solutions rather than to have the judge decide. Yeah, that's why your the stories are so interesting because they reflect somebody's you know determination, somebody's. Uh, reaction that this is a good deed. It's a mitzvah. That somebody should mitzvah Yiddish. Word. Yes, yes. It comes into your life and actually cares enough about you, even though it's professional. They care enough about you to try to help you where you live, and I think that's uh, that must give you a lot of gratification. Why did you do this anyway? Yes. Well, I come from a, a kind of a ministerial background. I took some time off after practicing law for a number of years, and uh, you know, really just helping people, listening to people, um, you know, bringing them to a better place, um, encouraging healthy relationships is really something that I'm drawn to and I want to be a part of. Uh, I don't want to be part of um, a system that is there to just slug it all out at all costs. Well, I think a lot of lawyers who get into divorce get out of divorce for that reason. <laughs> they don't want to be in the slugfest and, and they'll do bloody anything else, <laughs> uh, you know, to get out of that. So uh, you never, well... You, you, you are getting out in the way by staying in, you know, <laughs> by improving it from the inside. I think that's great. Yeah. Yes. So high expectations in terms of uh, the, the way it works because, uh, you know, the, there will be times. I mean, I remember one case. I won't mention any names because I could never mention any names about a family that decided to spend a ton of money fighting with each other. And they, they did spend everything, mm -hmm. uh, theoretically. Uh, they spent like $600,000 fighting oh. with each other, you know. And at the end of the day, 
they, they didn't spend it because they refused. They both refused to pay the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> So who wins then? Right, know? right. I guess there's some karma there. <laughs> there is karma. You know, it's payback, it's payback. Right, right. You want to encourage your client to do this? Right. You don't deserve to get paid. Right, right. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a remarkable thing about it. So, I mean, what you know, what does it take? Are you are you solo? Do you have a, a other lawyers working with you in this in this practice, or is it just you? Okay, well, um, you know, I have my own firm, but we um, have developed a practice group which has uh, two dozen collaborative uh, collaboratively trained attorneys, and so we're all going to be working together in. Um, you know, uh, working out these uh, divorces collaboratively. I'm also right now arranging a, t uh, a, a training for financial experts and mental health experts. We have slots for uh, 17 people to be trained in a two-day training well, that I'm arranging. It's a stable. You're, you're creating a stable. Uh, a stable, yes. And then they're going to um, have an opportunity to join our team as well. So um, within the next few months, we'll have 40 trained collaborative professionals oh, in our community. Great. So you won't you won't you won't uh, lay exclusive on them though. They could work for somebody else too. Of course, yes, yes. But you'll help make make sure that that they're trained and make sure that they're acceptable to you that way cuz it's kind of a uh, they got to go through this to be acceptable to you. Right. Well, the 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 collaborative model is um, a model that has been adopted and implemented in a number of jurisdictions on the mainland and internationally. So it's, it's a tried and true method where um, the professionals are trained in the collaborative practice and it's, you know, doing the paradigm shift rather than a win-lose. It's a team approach. So we're going to um, practice together and role play together. So um, we'll feel more comfortable uh, working as a team. You know, it strikes me that divorces, I, mean, I guess you always have to ask this question every time you talk to anybody. Is this the way it is? If this is the way it is now, does it change? In other words, <clears throat> so you fix a divorce. They make a property settlement agreement. You walk them out the door as, as happy campers, relatively speaking. Um, then things change. Then, for example, uh, the husband finds that he really can't afford that alimony that he agreed in this, mm -hmm. in this consensus model mm -hmm. that he agreed to pay. He can't afford it. And the wife, well, she's not so sure that he's telling the truth or you know, that he can't fix that somehow and find other work in order to pay that alimony. Um, so now you have a contention. Okay. So are you guys open for a, a replay? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Yes, yes. I, you know, that they were able to come to agreement at first, you know, initially. Um, I still think that there's a chance, even if there's a hiccup and uh, there's some changed circumstances. Um, why not? Why can't we come back to the table and rework things and see if we can come up with and solutions? And he can explain and, and, and she can try to be kind and and she can know more about his life in the aftermath, okay. you know. And, and, and maybe by then she's working and her income has gone up too. I mean, we just don't know. But that's why I think keeping that possibility open. Yeah. That we can come back, um, rework things, yeah. and see if we can come up with an amended agreement. Yeah. Well, you know, my experience is when after they're divorced, and they go their own ways, and, and assuming they had a bad experience in the divorce, they're really more angry at each other. <laughs> and when they get out there, the husband, you know, is very likely to say, I'm never paying alimony. Let her chase me to the end of the earth, you know. <laughs> and, the, and the legal structures, you know, don't really resolve this very well. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have a show court's order in court, it's acrimonious and uh, nasty, and, and nobody's really digging down to find the reality of it. Right. You know? post degree stuff, yeah, it just gets to be messy. And, yeah, yeah, messy. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, but, if, you know, if you offered yourself, and if they were willing to come back mm -hmm. uh, for adjustments, so to speak, mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be another mitzvah, wouldn't it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely leave open that possibility, because, yes, yeah, circumstances do change. And, uh, but, you know, we thought up a good solution at first, so I think there's an opportunity to come up with even more creative solutions. Yeah, oh, that's great. So, okay, so now we have um, we have a situation where it breaks up. I mean, that the the attempt at Pono divorce doesn't work. Okay. And they're out there fighting. Do you do you, do you get drawn in to the fight, or you you don't want to be involved in that? You know, and you have that in your what do you call it, agreement? The participation agreement. Participation agreement, mm -hmm. you, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, you're not involved, but could you be called in as a witness? Uh, could you be called in to 
could you be subpoenaed, for example? Okay. Uh, the deuces take them, you know, for records and all that you managed to accumulate in the, in the process of trying to work it out amicably. Right. Well, one thing that's wonderful about collaborative force is that it's private and confidential. So we cannot be, you know, subpoenaed in to testify uh, about any matters uh, relating to that, prior negotiations. Yes, um, yes, with respect to prior negotiations. So that's similar to mediation. That, um, and one of the draws of mediation, again, is also that um, any negotiations that occurred in trying to come up with that agreement um, will not be dragged into court. And that's to encourage really the free exchange of information uh, when they're trying to come up with that settlement, um, you know, for people to offer up yeah, things. Otherwise, you couldn't do it. Right. You Otherwise, then protection. you'd always. Right, right, exactly. And, th and that, again, encourages the free sharing of information, um, you know, people to be able to negotiate in a way yeah, that sure. is different than if it was adversarial and position based. Then I think people are just much less likely to, you know, give concessions, offer concessions to each other. And this, this protection yeah. also covers your, your, your team, right? They yes. can't be subpoenaed either because that would really wreck their their ability to do the work right you know oh that's a very good thing so it just strikes me this is very enlightened even more enlightened than i thought and it must be very popular on the mainland it must be sweeping like wildfire all over the mainland i mean to rational people yes yes anyway um collaborative divorce was invented by a, a person a, a divorce attorney his name is Stuart webb and that was on january 1st of 1990 so about 23 <laughs> years ago he's okay. in minnesota and he just said i'm tired of you know, having to, uh, you know, have families fight and just the process is so unhealthy. So, you know, he decided that he was going to do it this different way. And it's really caught on. Um, I was trained by Pauline Tesler, who caught on very early in the process. She and St Stuart Webb are probably the most well-known collaborative attorneys um, who uh, a number of years ago, they, they both got the ABA award in being the best problem-solving attorneys. And they take they take that honor very very seriously, and they are, you know, they take that with them everywhere they go. Is that they come up with ways to be able to solve problems that really help people. Um, it's you know, how many families have they touched in the twenty three years? Oh, I'm sure, they, thousands of families. But also, they managed to touch other lawyers, yes, and legislatures. <laughs> in the world. <laughs> They've probably written a lot of books or articles. Yes, I do. I anyway. have um, one of Pauline Tesler's bo books, which she co-authored with um, a psychiatrist named uh, Peggy Thompson. It's yeah. called Collaborative Divorce. Yeah. Well, collaborations are always good, especially yes. in, uh, you know, I mean, I knew a guy, for example, that's a lawyer who specialized in helping uh, family disputes in closely held corporations. Mm -hmm. And uh, guess who was on his staff? His staff included a psychiatrist. That's what made uh -huh. me think of this. Sure. Because it was a father fighting with son, <laughs> fighting with mother, fighting with siblings and all that. Uh -huh. And it was, it was more actually psychiatry than it was law. <laughs> he was the documenter, mm -hmm. but she was the one, the psychiatrist was the one who solved the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the same here, you know, it strikes me that in the, in the practice, at least as I know it years ago, uh, it was hard. Because you had to have command of every fact, you know, you had to have the litigator mentality, mm -hmm. and you had to have command of, of every point of law you were relying on, and you had to had to have command of what the other guy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what he was arguing to. So, and it was a tightrope, tightrope, hard, unpleasant, mm -hmm. uh, demanding, risky for a lawyer. Um, okay, you don't have those problems. That's why I envy you. <laughs> you, your primary role, as my friend with the corporate, uh, you know, infighting, your primary role is to solve the problem on a social basis. You're more interested in the outcome than in arguing some motion. Yes. <laughs> <You know>? yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, do you ever come and, you know, okay, so now they're talking property settlement agreement. Mm -hmm. And the guy says, well, I want this. And you say, well, you know, if you went to court, you know, it's like a mediator would say. <laughs> right, you know, right. If you the to reality court, check. You lose that point, right? <laughs> reality check. Do you do that? Do you do that in, in front of divorce? Well, I mean, you, 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 since you've got both parties agreeing to something, you can't have something that's so skewed, and you've got a a, a number of specialists who are all helping. It's not going to be a, a case where you've got some crazy result. I mean, it's got to be something that everybody can live with, and it's going to be seen as reasonable. Um, and that's sometimes where you kind of got to get both parties to s sit down and 
uh, one might really think, gosh, is that really reasonable? But, you know, okay, yeah. you have that or you have yeah, this yeah. other thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is unpredictable. You don't, you don't have any control over that outcome. Yeah. Very little control over that yeah, outcome. Yeah. So, okay, you've got that or you've got that. Which one would you choose? Yeah. Um, also, you know, that person really wants that. Well, okay, but then what can your spouse then give in exchange? You know, um, and it could be non-monetary. It doesn't have to be. I, I Maybe I'm making a presumption that... Um, it's something monetary that he would like. It's a monetary interest when you talk about property settled in. But oftentimes there's sure. other things. Sure, and you can do that here. And or, there's even, no... or even an apology. An apology is priceless. It is. <laughs> do you, in, in litigated cases, do you ever get an apology? No, that, that's like no. an admission of, of liability. Never. No, right? never. Um, and, and, uh, people ask for it sometimes, but it's never forthcoming. Oh, right. It's forced and, you know, it's not, it's <laughs> not me. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> You know, this is very interesting, though. I mean, if suppose in this system, the husband is a control freak, the wife is diminutive. Okay. They come to you. They sign the participation agreement, and the husband thinks, you know, in his executive brain, that oh. he's going to use <laughs> okay. he's going to use his skills to dump on the wife and to have her agree to everything. So they walk in, and you can see this. You can see this as clear as day. You can see that he's he's making a grab. Mm -hmm. of some kind, or it could be the other way. Um, how do you stop that? Do you say, wait, you can't do that. We, we don't buy that. Me and my team don't think that's fair. We're not going to stand by for that. No? Yeah. Uh, um, the team kind of <laughs> gets them all in line and will make it so we're really dealing fairly with one another. Um, also in like my retainer agreement, for instance, if, you know, we, we can't, somebody can't use collaborative practice to gain an advantage uh, you know, they really got to be go coming into it in good faith, and they're really going to try to be dealing fairly with one another. So you kind of so. feel, I, I, this is a contradiction in terms, but you kind of feel that you represent both of them. That that this crucible that you're establishing here is a crucible that protects both sides. Yes, and, and in a way that's different than mediation, because mediation, you've got, uh, you know, the most typical simplified model is you have a neutral uh, third-party mediator, yeah. and then you have both parties, but they're not necessarily represented by attorneys. Yeah. And so sometimes you can have really off-the-wall kind of agreements if there's a power imbalance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but with collaborative law, um, there'll be two collaborative lawyers. And so you, uh, you do have an attorney on your side, but we're all working towards the same outcome, you know, um, solution-based outcome that's really going to work best for the family. So, yeah, it's... Um... Suppose he says to you, uh, you know, Lisa, you know, I have this friend down the block. He's, he's an attorney, and he's a divorce attorney. I'd like to bring him in, you know, just have him sit at the table with all these experts and with you and just, you know, sort of, you know, shed some light, his, express his views. <laughs> what would you say to that? <laughs> you know it's a setup. You know that. <laughs> you say no, right? Right. I mean, that wouldn't be appropriate. <laughs> you know, and if I'm presuming that that attorney is not a collaborative attorney, so uh, it just sounds like no. that might be a way to sabotage the process. Yeah. And so I would be very, yeah, I'd be skeptical about it. So if you that. found that somebody was not being forthcoming, not provide, not transparent, not providing information, not being reasonable, uh, trying to take advantage of the process in one way or the other, or you in mm -hmm. one way or the other. Mm -hmm. We're not paying the fee. I mean, I don't know how you, t if you take it up front, then uh, that's not a problem. <laughs> but but if it's, you know, it's an ongoing fee, then it could be a problem if mm -hmm. don't pay you. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't like what's going on, if it doesn't pass your smell test, um, what do you do? Drop out? Right. Yeah, uh, under my retainer agreement, if they are not um, complying with the things they were supposed to, that could that results in constructive termination of the agreement, of the engagement. So um, that could happen. Hopefully, we can get you know we can get the situation so they are more cooperative and they're really um, acting in the spirit of collaborative divorce, how they're supposed to. But well, it's not that you uh, would. It's <laughs> it's it's that it's a sanction, uh -huh. and so it keeps things in line. Right. You know, it's a, it's a it's a discipline that you need to have a, a, the container for this whole discussion. Right, you know? right, right. <laughs> so. Well, I and I'm really impressed with this because I think that in, in large part, you know, this is personal. What I mean is if you're involved in this discussion, if you're forcing them to be fair, if you're putting your moral imprimatur on what happens so that nobody's taking advantage, 
that's you personally. I mean, they're coming to you for you. They're coming to you for your life experience, your sense of fairness, your personality, how you deal with people, and your social work, <laughs> <laughs> your social work characteristics. Um, <clears throat> but if it was some guy who wasn't, some person who wasn't as good with those things, he wouldn't be able to do as well, would he, in, in, in Pono divorce, you know, in this special kind of collaborative divorce, right? Um, so you're saying just realistically, if you got somebody who's very kind of selfish, kind of narcissist, thick personality, just took sides, then... took sides, that'd be the worst thing that he took sides, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So I mean, it's not for everybody, and so in a way, pono divorce or a collaborative divorce is self self selecting because some people will be very drawn to it, and other people just won't even go near that way, you know, yeah. go that way. So, um, but yes, we we hope that there's enough people out there who really want to. Um, resolve their divorce issues in a way that's going to be fair and that's going to enhance the communication um, um, between the uh, between the spouses and really work out things for the best. So, to what extent do you must you rely on staff to do anything? If I if I go into a, I mean, I call it a divorce mill. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't even be talking to the lawyer for a while. Mm -hmm. I'll be talking to staff and filling out forms and questionnaires and, <laughs> <laughs> and paralegals maybe. But, you know, I won't, I won't get to the big cheese for a while. <laughs> so uh, do you rely on staff in, in a practice like this, or is it just you? Um, it's just me, and I really like the one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, with, with my clients. Uh, you know, if, if they feel comfortable um, addressing me on my first name uh, with a first name basis and vice versa, that I'm perfectly comfortable with that. In fact, I prefer that. Um, that's one thing that's nice about um, the paradigm shift of, of collaborative divorce versus litigation. It's it's less formal, but in a way that I think um, there's a connection there, that a professional connection that I can have with uh, with a client. Yeah. Um, that I think is it's it's better. I mean, I think humans are 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 meant to be connected in that way and not uh, uh, so like formal and so kind of put off and uh, yeah. you know, and especially when they're going through a really tough time in their life, like going through yeah. a divorce. Yeah. You know, they want somebody they can trust. They want somebody they can talk with. Um, I can bring on the divorce coach also if it you know, they're really having a lot of trouble that goes beyond what my expertise is. Then we bring in the divorce coach and they can and they can speak with that person too. Well, what is the divorce coach now? The divorce coach will be um, people on the interdisciplinary team, the mental health professionals, and we encourage each um, spouse to hire a divorce coach to really work with them on the emotional issues, uh, the relationship issues okay. that will. Um, they will confront in the divorce and even after the divorce. Oh, this all sounds terrific. It sounds brilliant, actually. It sounds like it, as I say, it should have happened a long time ago. And for you, it sounds like a real mitzvah that you could, you know, do good for people and for the community in, in avoiding all this, all the, you know, the, the breakup of families. And, uh, I wonder how it looks, though, looking down the road. I mean, you could be very popular. <laughs> they could come from miles around, <laughs> and you would you would be you know and and the reality is you can only handle so much emotional outgiving at a given time. You know, it's not it's not a, a you know an unlimited supply. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what? How would you handle that when you when you find that they're lining up at your door? Well, you know, I will do as much as you know as my resources can um, um, can permit. I'm I'm hoping that. Other lawyers will also be engaged in a paradigm shift that they want to see um, problems solved differently uh, in a healthier way for families. So, uh, you know, we've got two dozen collaboratively trained lawyers. We're hoping that even more jump on and more will be uh, really giving and, and want to provide the service to the community. So there's a there's actual there's a bar of collaborative lawyers right now. Yes, they're two here dozen, in Hawaii. Two dozen, yes. and they're all practicing. Um, right, they're they are practicing. You know. Pretty much all of them, though, are still engaged in the traditional model because this is new. Right. But, um, you know, they would like to see that their practices shift right. um, as collaborative practice gets more and well, more uh, well known uh, here. here so, do you, I mean, you know them, uh, I guess, from bringing the subject to, to the fore, but you think there's a possibility that there will be firms of multiple lawyers who will be practicing collaborative divorce? I certainly hope so. Um, yeah. I know uh, I have a colleague, and he would love to do it. He has 
uh, a number of associates working for him, and he would like to do collaborative divorces exclusively. But it'll take some time for the shift to come. Since I started my practice three months ago and, and focusing in ex exclusively on collaborative divorce, um, you know, I'm the one really pushing this, this marketing thing through because I have a lot of time to, to do it as I develop, you know, you gather oh, the I, cases. I you'll have great gratification over it. Yes, yeah. yes. So what about this guy with the firm? Every, he's interested in collaborative divorce, but maybe his associates aren't, or they don't uh, have the, the personal skills to do it? No, I think, uh, you know, I, I think ideally if they could all do it, that would be that would be wonderful. So you could have a juggernaut firm doing this. It's possible to have a firm of, you know, I mean, a bigger firm of, of dozens maybe even in Hawaii mm -hmm. uh, doing this and being a center, you know, of, of the, the kinder, gentler, uh, divorce practice. Uh huh. You know? Uh huh. And that that one attorney did um, give us seed money to provide the training. So he's really putting his money where his uh, desires fall. And so I'm really I'm that really makes me feel hopeful that um, this is really going to take off here in Hawaii. So what does it cost? What does it cost? <laughs> well, um, normally attorneys charge an hourly fee with a retainer. So um, you know each attorney will. You know, uh, they, they have their own set fees and whatnot. Um, those people on the interdisciplinary team also have their fees also. So, you know. They bill separately. They, they Right. They would bill separately. So um, depending on the couple's you know, financial resources. Um, oh, you know, you'd we, be sensitive to that. Well, yes. I mean, uh, ideally, if they could, if, if the couple can um, have, uh, you know, each have a collaborative attorney. Uh, each have a divorce coach if they have a minor ch child, a child specialist, and one financial neutral. That's six individuals. Um, if you compare that, though, to a full-blown lit litigation oh, case. No comparison. Yes. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Right. Hundreds of thousands. And also that um, we're really focusing in on the values here. Um, so it's an investment of money that, you know, it, it'll reap returns, uh, you know, priceless returns in the end. And, and after the divorce. It is priceless, you know. The lawyers have, many, many, most lawyers, I think, that you ask them how they liked law school, they didn't like law school, <laughs> right? And if you ask them how they, how they liked those first few years of practice where they had to work ridiculous hours for people who were not very kind to them, <laughs> 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 they, would, they would say I don't like that either. And in fact, most most lawyers, uh, I would say most lawyers, uh, you know, it's a it's a living, but it, it isn't anything to write home to mom about, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in terms of gratification. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but this is different. Yes, and uh, realistically, because we can resolve the divorce issues uh, quicker, you know, we're we're not billing out as much as far as attorney's fees. But what you get in return for that is you get a lot of work satisfaction. I could see doing this for 20 to 25 years. I'm in my late 40s, but heck, I could do this for 25 years, you know. It's a great career. <laughs> yes. It would give you great gratification. You'd be yes. able to sleep well at night. Uh-huh. And uh, tell your grandchildren the, uh, about the good things that you provided to the community. <laughs> oh yes, yes. Because when I when I hear uh, friends that have gone through divorces when they were children and how their parents couldn't even talk to one another or at weddings, you know, they, you know, you know, can we move? You know, can we do things better? Can we make it so um, set things up so that doesn't continue to happen? We don't have generation upon generation of of hurt individuals. Um, and I think it's possible. I think doing things a different way, like this way, um, makes me hopeful that things can change for the better. Now, my, my last question, maybe my biggest question. <laughs> so we have a new model here, a model, a kinder, gentler model for the practice of law. Luckily, we now have it in this community. Why couldn't we extend this model to other types of disputes? Well, in Hawaii, the Uniform Collaborative Law Act provides that open door <laughs> that all sorts of disputes can be resolved this way. You can have a participation agreement. If you've got family members, you've got siblings dealing with an estate issue and they're just driving each other nuts and they're ready to take each other to the court, um, the act does provide that these, these disputes can be resolved collaboratively. Uh, Employer-employee disputes, malpractice disputes, 
you know, just about any type of dispute where there was a relationship that um, is strained, but we're going to see what we can do to resolve it and not drag each other through the court process yeah. and irreparably harm these relationships. After a while, people will actually get to like lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope so. I hope so, too. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thank Wonderful you. to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. <Jake. laughs>